All right, we're live. Oh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this Friday morning. I hope you guys are excited for the weekend. Happy spring. <laughs> My name is Ruby. I'm the director of the Federal Institute. I am joined by Kay Stewart, who is our researcher, writer, and director of veterinary outreach. And we are also joined by Daniel Shuloff, who is the CEO and founder of Keto Natural Pet Foods. And we're so excited to talk about this hot, hot topic. Um, well, many of you guys know that I came from a legal background. So anytime I see a lawsuit <laughs> in the news, I'm always just like, what's going on? And it isn't very often that it comes to light in our dog food industry. So thank you, Daniel, for joining us today. Really excited to hear what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, you bet. It's my pleasure being here. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, the law and dog food. And so doggy <laughs> lawsuits are certainly something uh, I love talking about. Um, I'm in agreement with you. Yeah, it's, it's rare. And I think it's kind of too rare, I would say, in that it's like historically class action lawsuits and other forms of litigation have been important tools, vehicles for social change, particularly when it has to do with large corporate malfeasance. And I think you see too few of them, frankly, in the dog food world. Um, there are, you know, you could brainstorm and come up with a hundred different instances of misconduct on a widespread basis that I think you'd at least be able to kick around the idea of whether there's a legal theory that imposes liability for it. And so, yeah, I think it's under underdone. Well, I think the other thing is these are gigantic corporations that we're talking about who have a lot of money to settle these suits out of court. And so they come up, but we don't always hear about them. That's when right. That's right. Yeah. But it's also the case, you know, here's another interesting thing about it, I would say, is that like one of the things that came up over the course of I wrote a book, you held, held it up, you apparently read it too. <laughs> and, but over the course of writing that book and over the course of putting together the litigation. One thing that you come to grips with really quickly, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar with, is that like a lot of the institutions that are at, that we as a society sort of formally charge with telling us what is true and what is not true have been perverted and kind of co-opted in the pet food space, particularly those having to do with the scientific community. Mm -hmm. And so you run into this world where it's like, well, wait a second, these guardrails aren't working. We have, because these big companies have conducted inroads and these things that we've always looked to as arbiters of truth, they're no longer reliable in that way. So what is a reliable way to communicate the truth? And like the court system lies outside of that framework. And so it's like, they're gonna render judgments about truth and falsity here, right? Sure, and sure. Like judges, as you I'm sure know, federal judges are appointed with lifetime tenure. It's not realistic that the, or it's certainly harder for a big corporate actor to influence that the way that they can influence, you know, folks from the scientific community. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, for those of you guys that are just tuning in, uh, would love to know where you're tuning in from. I see we have the healthy pet. Uh, I think this is Kenzie from Eugene, Oregon. Daniel, where are you based? I didn't even ask you. I live in the lovely city of Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm. Ah, okay. And yes, we <laughs> lived here. I've lived here for 12 years now, my fiance and I and our dogs are very into outdoor recreation and Salt Lake City. For those that are tuning in from, I don't know, the East Coast or mm -hmm. West Coast, you might not know it is a paradise for that kind mm -hmm. of thing. It's right at the foot of a big mountain range and all the mountain recreation is more, much more accessible than in places even like Denver. And so we love it here. And um, awesome. Going anywhere. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Well, to the, the topic of today's discussion is the DCM fraud class action that has been filed against Hills Pet Food uh, by Keto Natural. And that's why we asked Daniel to come on to sort of tell us about that. As we started in the beginning of this live, you know, we don't see these class actions very often. I, I actually, I would say we don't see <laughs> the outcome of the class actions very often. We hear the beginning phases of it and then that's kind of it. Wouldn't you say so, Kay? I would think so. And I, I think one of my first questions is why did you pick Hills to put the class action suit? Um, because I did a variety of evidence gathering projects okay. having to do with all kinds of things, but kind of most notably probably, uh, I used a federal law called the Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act to obtain a big volume of records from the FDA. 
and that volume of records and the other evidence that we came up with led in this direction. Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't go into it. I, I started putting together evidence from a place of like, this smells wrong and there's fishy stuff. And I've written a book about this and I know historically what the best, the practices that have been used in this domain are. I know I can recognize some of the people that were involved in this from the beginning. And, you know, I saw some of that just made it like, oh, something's up here. This mm -hmm. is, has me very suspicious. Then I went through the process of gathering the relevant evidence to kind of confirm or deny that suspicion. And it leads to a theory of, I mean, not a theory of liability, but a lawsuit showing that Hills committed misconduct. Mm -hmm. There should be liable for this. Can you provide a brief overview of the key allegations that are outlined in the suit for people that might not be familiar? Sure. So essentially what we allege in the suit is that the DCM fiasco was intentionally created by Hills Pet Nutrition and a cluster of other affiliated defendants that are they're all uh, parties that are also defendants in the lawsuit. So this mm -hmm. lawsuit is not just against Hills, it's against this other these other organizations and individuals that worked as part of a single group, a conspiracy to effectuate an outcome that would be good for Hills. They did this intentionally and that the goal of the scheme was to mislead the public, both the lay public and the veterinary community about whether or not BEG pet foods increase the risk of DCM or not. Um, and so that's sort of, in a nutshell, what we allege happened. As I'm sure you guys know, outside those allegations, the DCM fiasco itself, as a, just an issue, mm -hmm. has been the rare, like Ruby said, pet food issues don't typically become like big mainstream news issues. And like DCM is the exception. It's such a big issue that it got covered in the New York Times. It got covered in the Washington Post. It was, and in some circles like is, the hottest pet food issue for a long time had massive impact on the market in all kinds of ways mm -hmm. as we show in the complaint those have tended to be ways that have been very good for hills market change has been excellent for hills as a company and broadly for the rest of the industry with the exception of a couple of other small large uh, a small number of large companies it's been really bad for um, sure. And so, uh, yeah, that's sort of the, the suit in a nutshell. I can go into like how they carried out that scheme at a, at a more granular level, but that's the general. Well, let's, let's break it down a little bit. What, how would you just de describe the DCM fiasco? What does that mean? Um, I guess what, I, what it means to me is the spread of the belief that I believe is false and that it is not supported by the evidence that BEG, which is to say boutique exotic ingredient or grain free dog food products, increase the risk that your dog is going to get the disease DCM or that it's going to get their disease is going to get worse. Mm -hmm. um, and the spreading of that false belief in the public, lay community, veterinary community, is the fiasco. It's a false belief. And so the idea that more and more hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people come to hold it is the why I think of it as a fiasco. So the allegation is essentially that this they, they conspired. Uh, the Hills and a few other defendants conspired to create this narrative that these types of foods uh, would, as you said, create... Uh, perpetuate this disease, the DCM is dilated cardiomyopathy, or make it worse. And what? who are the other defendants that were named in the suit? So there are two organizations and five individuals. The two organizations are ostensibly nonprofits. They are both affiliated closely with Hills. One is called the, and one is a relatively familiar one, I would imagine to the listeners here, and one maybe not. Um, one is called, the familiar one, it's called the Morris Animal Foundation. Oh, yeah. Morris Animal Foundation. <laughs> they, uh, at a very general level, collect money from donors and use that money to fund scientific research. That's the main thing that they generally do. They're called the Morris Animal Foundation because they were named after a guy named Mark Morris. Mm -hmm. And in a weird this is kind of weird, but the founder of Hills Pet Nutrition was Mark Morris. It's not called Morris Pet Nutrition for some right. reason. Right. <laughs> Mark Morris was the founder of Hills Pet Nutrition. So it shows you 
the degree of relevance of that company to that other nonprofit organization, it has his name. It's the Morris Animal Foundation. They're one of two organizational defendants besides Hills. The other is also named after uh, Dr. Morris. It's called the Mark Morris Institute. Mm -hmm. Mark Morris Institute is a less familiar to a lot of like, you know, conscientious pet owners organization. Um, unlike the Morris Animal Foundation, which uses, mm -hmm. there you go. I do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, do that thing on my, yeah. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I'm looking at my version right now. Yeah. yeah. What, what Ruby's doing is holding up the back of one of, if not the most popular veterinary nutrition textbooks in the country and highlighting the fact that it was created by this organization called the Mark Morris Institute. Right. And so it's emblematic of what that group does more broadly. Mark Morris Institute gets money in and uses that money to develop the learning materials that are used to educate veterinary professionals in the United States. So that includes making textbooks like Ruby mm -hmm. has shown us, creating curricula for use at accredited veterinary schools, mm -hmm. putting on continuing education programs. And although I didn't even know this at the time I started out like on this evidence gathering journey, the most egregious thing of all is they do like full turnkey veterinary nutrition programs for accredited veterinary schools. So, and they mm -hmm. say they're 26, I think of 31 veterinary schools in the country. So what they do is like, if you guys wanted to evolve the real food Institute into the real food Institute university and, and, and make your own veterinary school and get it accredited. And if you were saying to yourselves, well, gosh, are we going to have a nutrition program? Well, we obviously are. I guess we could do it one of two ways. We could either hire uh, somebody who's qualified to teach that course and come have let that person find the materials they're going to use and put together the curriculum that they're going to use and all that stuff. And they're going to teach nutrition. Or we could reach out to Mark Morris and we could say, hey, Mark Morris Institute, we want to do this. It'll go great. We can do it for you turnkey. We'll give you the professor. We'll give you the course materials. We'll give mm -hmm. you the syllabi, all that. And oh, there's a benefit. We'll do it free. Yeah. Mark Morris provides that service free of charge to veterinary schools. Okay. Yes. And they're as because they're a, a nonprofit organization, their financial records need to be filed in public arenas. And if you look at those financial records, you'll see something really important, which is that every penny, not literally 100% of that organization's revenue comes from one organization altogether. It's Hills Pet Nutrition. Hills Pet Nutrition puts money into Mark Morris. Nobody else does. And then that organization goes out and provides teaching to veterinary schools free of charge. Mm -hmm. so of course, if you're in the, a position of starting up a school or yeah. just running a school, that's an, that's an unbelievably attractive proposition. I don't have to pay for any of this. I'm going to save millions of dollars. The, right. Of course, I'm going to do that. The, the expense that you're going to get, of course, though, is you're going to get doctored information. You're going to get Hills funded information. Right. And so anyway, that's a long winded way of saying Mark Morris Institute is the second. And then <laughs> five individual veterinarians. Though these are veterinarians that spend at least some of their time, if not most of their time, working as scientists and professors at major research universities. Mm -hmm. And they're people that in one way or another helped advance this narrative. And we allege that they did this for the benefit of Hills because they were receiving benefits either from Hills directly mm -hmm. or through an intermediary organization like Morris Animal Foundation, Mark Morris Institute. Wow. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I mean, you're tackling as many of the players yeah. as you can in one hit. Again, it's where the facts went. Like there's yeah. not, let's be serious here. Like this is a class action lawsuit. So if anybody that's listening to this doesn't understand what that means, what it means is like my company is the one that filed this, but we're trying to ask the court to let us represent every other company that's in the same position as us. Like in the U.S. court system, we'll allow, and Ruby knows this better than anybody, it's like there are some times when it doesn't make sense for the court to litigate everybody's similar case differently, that in certain circumstances, it makes sense to do them all in one place. And sure. this where like one big corporation has engaged in misconduct that harms a bunch of different but similar mm -hmm. small people is like kind of how is one of the exceptions. And so what we've asked the court to do is court, let us represent everybody that's been damaged by this. And as a result, the amount of damage that that group has sustained collectively is colossal. 
here. It's in the billions of dollars. It's more than two billion dollars, based on our best analysis now. Like it. Can very you long. share other companies that have joined That's the class? It. So the way that it goes is not we're the only company in the like we are asking the court to represent everyone. The classes we want it defined is everyone that makes B E G pet foods. That's <laughs> it's that simple. And it's like they've gone out of their way. The defendants in this case have gone out of their way to make sure like uh, one of the defendants is a um, professor at Tufts University named Lisa Freeman. And she mm. plays a bigger role in the allegation than any of the other defendants, very central to it. One of the things that she did is she and I think to this day, not that don't you check the complaint if you want to run this down to ground. But I, off the top of my head, I think this is right, that she still runs a blog through the school that she works at, which is Tufts University. Right. She runs this the Cummings. Uh, oh, geez. They, they call the blog Pet Foodology. Mm -hmm. and she published a cluster of articles that have been hugely impactful in this controversy on that website. And they've been impactful because they've been very widely read right. because they contain false information about the relevant issue. And one of the things that like she did, it, it's like the title, I'm paraphrasing, I'm in front of me, but like the title is like, it's not just grain free. And it's the ex explanation of why actually she coined the term, Lisa Freeman did, BEG diet. So it, that whole article was devoted to, no, 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 no. It's not just grain free. So what I'm trying to say is they went out of their way to say, it's this big, broader group that's very specific, although huge, and it's easy to define because when you use the definition they ask for, it's literally everyone that makes pet food in the country except for Hills, Nestle Purina Pet Care, and Mars Pet Care. <laughs> How convenient. So asking the court, <laughs> and their definition put us in, and that's kind of the, like, uh, yeah, so we're, we're saying let us represent all those people. Okay. One of the stages you get to in the class litigation process is like you ask the court to what's called certify the class action. And that's when you litigate these issues where we will say, this is the kind of case that should, all this should be resolved in one place. And Hills and the, the bad guys are such as they are would say, no, what really should happen is each one of these guys should have to sue individually. And if we win on that issue and the court certifies the case, then in the court's eyes, we are now ostensibly representing all the other BEG companies. And but what the court does in the in the U.S. legal system is like you have an opportunity to opt out. And so if oh, okay. you are, you, you know, your root, your guys pet food, uh, you said you're in pet food. I don't know if you sell pet food, but like if you do and you are a BEG company, we win class certification. The court says this class is going forward and Dan is representing you. One of the things they give you a chance to do is you can say, I'm out. I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to file the suit on my own. But it's, instead of opt in, it's opt out. It's, mm, OK, sure, sure. Have you heard uh, from? I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, Ruby. I was just going to say, but have you heard from any of the other companies directly? I have indeed. I have okay, indeed. good, good. Um, those are things that I probably can't talk about sure. here because they may have strategic importance, or because I don't have the authorization of the folks who reached out to me right. in confidence. But yes, unquestionably, the answer right. to that is yes, and it's not just one. But I'll also note that like another group, a lot of folks. So we explain the complaint. We've. BEG pet food companies have been damaged by the DCM controversy yeah. unquestionably. Other discrete, definable, large groups have been damaged too. And one of them is the, the, the brand, the kind of retailer that tends to sell products that are BEG weighted. Mm -hmm. And those folks have reached out in abundance because they're, mm -hmm. like, they're not part of this class. And they're like, I've been hammered by this issue too. What do I do? And so mm -hmm. we bring them in touch with our lawyers who bring these kinds of cases all the time. And they are actively working on investigating those claims and seeing whether they can put together mm -hmm. something else on behalf of those people. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> They've been damaged. I mean, like you hear, and it's, it's, uh, I don't know about the like overall dollars and cents at all about that side of the issue, mm -hmm. but I do know this, that like those folks tend to be mom and pop, yeah. but at least to a large degree, like they're a lot of them are not able to withstand like uh, the kind of downturn in demand that a larger company might be able to. And so sure, one sure. Business. and don't forget that one of the amazing facts is that like the DCM controversy predates COVID. Like the FDA announced its right. initial investigation into this before COVID, anyone knew what COVID was. But like it was raging when COVID was also raging. And so the demand for brick and mortar retail services was plummeting as well. It's that like one, two punch Mm -hmm. a lot of these folks and so yeah it's it's real legit sob story for a lot of them 
for sure. Yeah. So I, I want to circle back to some of the allegations and how um, Hill's financial performance sort of plays into, into these allegations. Before we do, for our audience, I know this, this live is a lot. We usually just talk about dog food <laughs> and, and yeah, and dogs and fun stuff and nutrition. I'm totally geeking out, but um, so I'm probably going to miss some of your questions. As you guys know, you've been in our lives before. We usually go about 30 to 40 minutes chatting and uh, answer any questions you might have. Go ahead and start putting those in the comments. So we'll if you need to head out, we'll address them as best we can, and you can go back and watch this replay. I also, um, like, for the record, for whatever it's worth, I try, I, I consider myself, uh, like, reasonably good at getting back to everybody that reaches out to me directly, and you can find through Keto Naturals, web presence, social media presences, how to do that. And so if anybody has questions that feel more ripe for me, I you'll hear back from me. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll drop those also in the comments as well before the end of this live. Um, so sort of circling back, I mean, pre-COVID, geez. So the, the suit was filed <laughs> this year, this February, this past February. Is that right? It is. Uh, and so what was the time frame that you're alleging that they conspired together? I mean, was this going back to before 2019, mm -hmm. 2017? So some of the <clears throat> relevant dates, the like the DCM story from a public perspective really began in July of 2018, mm -hmm. which is when the United States Food and Drug Administration issued a um, report, an update, a communication of some sort, an announcement right. that it had begun an investigation into whether or not these products or anything else are causing some previously unknown uh, thing involving DCM. And so July of 2018 is sort of when this arose in the, the mind of lots of folks in the public. It's when like the most media coverage of it began, like the story of Food and Drug Administration of the United States announces that huge category of products that millions of you are feeding your dog right now might give it a deadly heart disease. That's a big story. <laughs> and so the sure. Times covered it, Washington Post covered it, et cetera. Um, using that launch date as a reference point is a helpful way to think about the timeline here. Mm -hmm. and particularly, you, you mentioned before about the financial performance of Hills Pet Nutrition as pertains to that timeline. Mm -hmm. We explain in the complaint, I'm paraphrasing it now, not reading it. So the, to the extent that this did, isn't to the penny accurate with what's in the complaint, defer to that for the, as a source of truth as opposed to this comment, but I'm pretty confident. 2013 to 2018, the five years leading up to mm -hmm. the FDA's announcement of the DCM investigation. Hills Pet Nutrition's annual revenues grew by a cumulative over five years, total of 1%. So they were dead flat. That's including price increases and everything. Mm -hmm. Over that same period of time, the United States pet food industry as a whole grew by more than 30%. So Hills market share in the five years leading up to the DCM controversy plummeted. Okay. Mm -hmm. the revenues themselves stayed pancake flat and overall the market share plummeted. Virtually overnight with the launch of the DCM investigation, there is a mirror style reversal of that. Since the FDA announced its investigation in 2018, in the five years since that was launched, as opposed to the five years, in the five mm -hmm. years previous dead flat, in the five years since it began, they've just about doubled their revenue. They've gone from 2.09 wow. billion to their most recent quarter annualizes to 4.2 billion. Okay? So you are talking about the one of, if not the fastest growing pet food companies in the world. All of a sudden, from a place where it was losing hemorrhaging market share to mm -hmm. the fastest growing pet food company in the country, enjoying the longest period of sustained success in the history of this long serving company um, virtually overnight. Um, so it is a and it's colossal. Like I said, the reason it's a $2 billion lawsuit is because they've the windfall they've enjoyed from this has been colossal. What sort of benefit do you think the other five vet veterinarians that are named as defendants got from this? Yeah, it's outlined in the complaint, at least the things we know about now. So we're at a stage in order to file a lawsuit, you need evidence. So we mm -hmm. have evidence of the things I'm about to go through. 
But it's important to note that as lawsuits progress, you go through a more in-depth formal evidence gathering process. The other side has to comply with. So you do things like take depositions. So that's when a lawyer has somebody who's a witness for the other side under oath. And they have to answer questions about who gave the money, when it was, and you get to subpoena bank records, you get to subpoena all kinds of stuff. If the court thinks you have a valid law, a lawsuit that at least has the grounds to go forward into that process. So that will, in all likelihood, shake loose stuff that changes what I'm about to say. That being said, the five people that are named as defendants in this lawsuit all received some sort of financial remuneration from indirectly or directly from Hills Pet Nutrition. Either they themselves got paid by Hills, they got paid by an organization that gets paid by Hills, or Hills paid the organization that they work for, like Tufts itself has received right. addition to whatever direct remuneration Lisa Freeman has received directly from Hills, has also received grants from the Morris Animal Foundation, et cetera. And so that's basically it, is that these people got money for advancing this uh, issue. Have you, I know you've heard from the other companies that were potentially affected by all of this. Yeah, have you some, heard from yeah. any vets? Have I heard from any vets? I have, I have. You're going to like, there's, you know, the filing of the suit is not the same kind of newsworthy as the FDA beginning an investigation, but somewhat newsworthy. I also have professional contacts and personal friends who are veterinarians. And so I, you know, there are dozens probably of folks that in one way or another, I've had some kind of communication with, they run the gamut from folks who are, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not sure I've gotten any, like, how could you feedback? Like I sort of, sort of my calculus in deciding to do that, like, this is a scary thing. This is not like a carnival for me. <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I like this sort of stuff, but I don't like poking the bear on a billion dollar company that owns the industry that I compete in. And like, ultimately my thought as expressed in my book is that there are a lot of places that the veteran community is wrong about the mm -hmm. science of healthy feeding for dogs. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of largely it's a big part of my professional mission as a, as a CEO of a company, as somebody who writes about these issues, as somebody who's founded a nonprofit is to like help correct that. And so this organization, Hills Pet Nutrition, is like the most influential single organization, maybe with the exception of the AVMA, when it comes to veterinary perspectives in the world. And so, yeah, it's a scary thing to do that. And so you recognize, like, I'm not going to win. People are going to interpret this. Not 100 out of 100 people are going to see this the same way. And mm -hmm. it's a very emotionally charged issue. And so I'm like mentally prepared. Some of them are going to hate you for this. Like, I've done other public things at earlier stages of the DCM like controversy, I, tr I engaged in a pretty public effort to try to get one particular paper retracted from the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Mm -hmm. I initially did that. I got much more vitriol where I was like, people are like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's just, he's, he's bad because it's his product. He's killing dogs and he's just doing this because he's greedy. That's not, uh, I don't think I've gotten anything literally like that at all this time. And I have gotten things like, I mean, as far afield from each other as like, great job. I've always known this feels wrong and this is helping me understand it better. Mm -hmm. to, I have evidence to add to what is in the complaint and that should be. And I put them in touch with the lawyers. Like there are mm -hmm. people that have personal histories with the company and the other uh, defendants in the case that have stuff that is definitely relevant to the case. So, yeah, there's been a, a fair amount of it. Um, obviously, I have personal friends who have sort of like known this is coming and they have they understand how significant it is for me personally. And so they have a different vibe, whatever. Yeah. Well, one thing that I've learned from being in this industry is that dog owners tend to have a, a very strong loyalty to brands that they commit to. It's very rare that they change from one brand to another. So once you sort of attack uh, a brand that they care about. They just come out swinging, really not knowing any of the facts. You know, it's they don't know why you're even making these allegations. So it, with Hills being such a ginormous company, I would imagine that once this does gain a little bit more traction and public attention, that people are going to come out. And I mean, our hope yeah. is that <laughs> you oh. know this sheds some light on on what's actually happening. Are you afraid it might go the other direction? 
it is going to go. And so, I mean, it's just, it's not, this isn't a binary outcome. It's not that either everybody's going to love this or everybody's going to hate this. Right. People are gonna, there's going to be some fraction of people that fall all along the spectrum. I, it's my hope, my belief sincerely is that anyone, no matter how you feel about this issue, if you give it the time to engage with the stuff that I'm putting on the record, what I'm talking about like today, that you're not going to hate me. You're going to A, understand where I'm coming from. And in, I mean, 99 out of 100 kids, you're going to agree with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be a serious number of folks who don't have some kind of direct financial incentive that are, if they gave it that chance, would not, would come out being like, I still think what you're doing is horrible. But that being said, some fraction of people are, because most people aren't going to give it that time. If you feel that way, that's not how, alas, like facts get litigated in the lowercase l version of the world in the internet, you know, world. Okay. You go into your hole and you fight that way. So yeah, I am fearful of it. It stinks. Like, let me just be super clear that like, I went through that, just fielding that kind of vitriol when I did the earlier retraction effort. And it is not fun. <laughs> Not fun as part of the calculus and deciding whether or not to do this, but like been through it once, learned some things along the way about how to deal with it and what it means. And I've, I guess, gotten more empathy. Like, I I think I like to think that I approach it with a good bit of empathy. Like, sometimes when people always, when people reach out, they're either like they've got too strong an incentive or they're trying their best and they're being misled. And even and being misled and getting to a place where you're angry about it, not about being misled, but you're angry about something because you've been misled is a real thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, if you just take the approach of like, I'm not even hearing you, you're on the other side, you don't make the kind, you don't bridge in the way mm -hmm. you care. And so I try to be empathetic with it. I am amazed how little um, headway the, the news got when the FDA actually retracted the statements that it could be causing DCM and said there's no evidence. Now Why? that Why are you surprised? <laughs> no, I'm not, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it's so frustrating. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't say I'm amazed, but it's frustrating because and that's where I think this kind of conversation comes in because people can be like, well, wait a minute, what? The FDA retracted that? You know, because that didn't come out. And so I think it's really important that people realize there were hundreds of studies done in the six years since that first allegation came out and none of it showed that these foods were causing this. And yet that's not being told to the public. It just kind of quietly went away. Yeah. So language in this subject becomes super important. Mm -hmm. So they're like you have to be, you know, scientists that are doing that stuff professionally are historic are typically are expected to be very precise with language because you don't say things that don't mean it's easy for when we're having conversational type of uh, exchange to like lump a lot of stuff together and use sort of terms like association correlation causality all a little bit like interchangeably or a little bit casually in this case it's a super important thing mm -hmm. because these are factually different statements right. and they mean different things that said all with that said here are some of the things that we show in the that we allege in the complaint and document by walking the court through the studies. Of all of the DCM related studies that have been put out by the the, the vets in this case, like the mm -hmm. defendants, have done the bulk, as you would not be surprised to learn, of the published research that is involves DCM and BEG diets in the United States since the FDA began its thing. Take all those studies, put them all together. Here are some things you do not have. You do not have one shred of evidence mm -hmm. that feeding a BEG diet increases the risk of DCM. It doesn't cause DCM, but that higher incidence rates of DCM are correlated with those diets. There's, mm -hmm. there's that's never been. You have like, mm -hmm. uh, you also have no evidence that absent other common, as you would know, okay, mm -hmm. common treatments for nutritionally mediated DCM like supplementation with taurine most mm -hmm. notably you don't have any studies in which a dog was switched from a beg diet to a non-beg diet and its dcm got better in any right. measurably clinically significant way it lived longer the disease went away the only cases where that's happened is where they're like well we switched its diet and gave it the things that cure dc it's like we the, the analogy yeah. that we came up with that we use in the complaint is like if you have a person who quits smoking and stops wearing hats, 
you don't have proof that hats and <laughs> or hats and lung cancer are correlated. Yeah. I screwed it up. You get what I'm saying? It's like right. you have a known causal factor at play. You can't say that there's a and so in any event, you don't have any studies that show either of those two things. Right. You would let of course you let alone have studies in which folks are saying things like this is evidence that these diets cause this disease. Like it's there's definitely nobody that. Yeah is even engaged with the scientific record on this subject at a 101 level, will say that. That's mm -hmm. like including the defendants in this case. They go, well, of course, we don't yet have airtight causation. And it, as we explained in the complaint, the reason that it seems that that's being done is like that is a period that you can sustain indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Like you can say until the rest of time, well, we don't know for sure yet, but we have a lot of studies that are associating DCM right. and BEG diets. And that's sort of the buzzword that they've used. And in mm -hmm. the scientific context, that means correlation. Nothing. They yeah. actually haven't found that. It's a false statement about the scientific record. What is, you know, beyond the financial remedy, like the damages that were done to your company and any other words that fall under those categories, what's your personal desired outcome from the suit? Oh, I think that most fundamentally, I think the suit is part of, like, I think of myself as having a broad professional mission, at least at this stage in my life, which is to make the companion animal care world more evidence based. I believe right now it suffers from not being very evidence based in important systematic ways and that the suffering has, takes the form of dogs that get more diseases than they need to dogs that die younger than they need to, and pet owners that have to pay for that, whether it's emotional pain of losing a dog, an animal that's only going to live a short life in the first instance or having to pay extra money for it. And I think that we're at a more evidence-based field, both as the lay public understood the evidence and as clinical practitioners understood the evidence, it would get better in those ways. And so I'm broadly trying to achieve that. I believe that this lawsuit helps to advance that end. One of the ways that I think it does that, that I think is a realistic target, is I would love if a big fraction of clinical veterinarians through the course of this lawsuit, obviously they're not going to be at that place right now. I've just mm -hmm. filed the suit. It just has allegations in it now. But if, I don't know, if so as we're recording this, just recently there's been a new national news item about another class action brought by another little guy against another big organization that now is a big matter of national news that has changed in industry, which is the National Association of Realtors. Years mm -hmm. ago, a bunch of small people, you know, as you guys know, if you ever bought a home, you pay a 6% commission. Well, these people got fed up with that as a practice. And they thought that the, the reason it was happening is this big, powerful group was doing anti-competitive behavior, filed a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit used in a very similar way. And over a period of years, it finally, they received vindication and it changed the way that that organization is perceived. I think that that kind of outcome here where it's like at the end of the day, if rising veterinary students, existing practitioners came away and said, geez, I guess I am being overly influenced in a way that's damaging to my patients and my professional development, that would feel like a big win. If that was like a measure, anytime that happens on an individual level, that's a win. If it happens on a systematic kind of way, those are few, those opportunities are few and far between. You know what I mean? Like, well, I, I mean, know. you're talking about reversing decades of brainwashing in these veterinary yeah. schools, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it, to a large degree, the main, and this is highlighted in greater detail in my book and in the, the allegations and the complaint too, but it's like kind of a lot of it took place in the eighties and nineties is like the mm -hmm. time when a lot of the inroads were being made here. But so, yes, you're talking about a period of decades of development by folks who have thousands of thousands of times more resources to devote right. to this project than I have to devote to it. So yeah, it's hard, but that's how it's the same story in the history of smoking in the United States. It's the same story in the history of climate change in the United States. Like this is what, what in my judgment, happen. in my judgment, what's happened here is like you have big, you have folks make a product that's phenomenal in some ways because, and the market wants it. In the, in the case of like kibble style, garden variety, kibble style dog food, when they start making it, it's like, wow, it's scoop and serve. It's really inexpensive. My dog mm -hmm. wants to eat it. It keeps my dog alive. Give me some more of this. And so the companies that make products like that are successful. They get big. Then science starts getting done. 
And then, oops, we realized for, through <laughs> the scientific research process that we got out over our skis a bit. And it turns out that this stuff might keep your dog alive in the short run, but it increases risk of disease and does all these other things. And so how are you going to, what are you going to do about, like once that starts coming out and you're that company, you can't, they don't just throw up their hands and go, okay, well, <laughs> we'll give up. It's the same with climate change, same with smoking. It's like what you do instead is you try to co-op that community, fight that, that emergence of those facts and beating it down takes a long time. It's slow, long game, but these sure. are efforts to take. I think, you know, Kay and I often on our live shows talk about how their need to just have, just be updated standards for the foods that we're feeding. Every, I don't know. I didn't know. I thought it was every single veterinary school relies on this small animal clinical, this big. Not course. every. I, probably the 26, out of, like you said, that are getting funding from them. I know yeah. um, the other companies have some foothold in some of the vet schools too. But I say every vet school is funded by a kibble company. It would be my guess. It's, and you know, I would say in it's the like UK also. Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't want to talk. No, about that's that. fine. I, I mean, it's in Europe and the UK also. I mean, it's not just in the US. And it's so. like the, the research community. It's like not just the educational side of it, but it's like inf influencing an uh, informational environment for professional people mm -hmm. doesn't right. just take place in like the teaching, right? There's lots of other avenues where you make inroads. Absolutely. But like the research side is like you, there are really, as you would imagine, as you know, of course, both of you know, there are lots of folks who go into who are like, I want to be a professional scientist. I want to do studies that help advance knowledge about this stuff. Some of them like doggy and kitty stuff, and they go into companion animal nutritional research. And that's their thing. You cannot do that job in the United States today unless you take grants that are tied to industry. It might be that it's coming from a different side of the industry, but there is not a significant mature alternative to that. Like the way that the NIH provides funding at a from a federally funded organization to individual researchers doing, you know, cancer research. Like that's not a thing in the doggy and kitty world. It right. is ultimately all of it can be traced back to one company or another if you follow mm -hmm. the money back far enough. And it's like, that's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. So I think that's, that's one of the reasons that um, I dig, dig, dig into research when I look for evidence about canine nutrition, because so many studies that were funded by NIH and, and those things for human medicine used dogs for those studies. So if you pull some of the data from those, you can really see what's going on. And it doesn't correlate with some of the things that the other studies that are being done that are funded by the um, kibble companies, they, they don't match up. But if it was, you know, if it was done on dogs for humans and they extrapolated that to humans, how is that not relevant to dogs? Absolutely. And it's like, there's this related phenomenon, which is that like in the human, the reason that there are um, human specific research that's been carried out on animal subjects is because on some level they're relevant to the human side, right? Mm -hmm. it's, but it's a lower cost. Like if it's a, for instance, a high right. risk intervention, you might use rodents on it because you'd rather that they die, God forbid, than people. And so they use what are called animal models. You know this, animal right. models help to inform the human side of the record. In the world of companion animal stuff, it's like you almost, you have to go the other way. There's like stuff that can be extrapolated in a, to a limited extent from the human side mm -hmm. to the doggy side. And it's like the, an issue that's very near and dear to my like professional life is the healthfulness or as the case may be, unhealthfulness of dietary carbohydrate for dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. And it's like on the in the human world, low carbohydrate science is the most popular topic in nutritional professional nutritional science. Right. More papers get done about that than anything else. None of it is done on the veterinary side because it has no profitable outcome for the folks right. whose foods are based on that. And so you have this huge disparity in the volume of evidence that's getting created. And in a functioning you know, scientific community, that would change, right? It would like, you'd see, you'd be a, right. a researcher and you'd go, well, a thousand studies came out last year saying that you know, dietary <laughs> carbohydrates shouldn't be fed to a dog with diabetes. Maybe we should do carry that out on our side too. But it's better, you know, let's feed it. Uh, Hills yeah. metabolic, it's 40% carbohydrate. That's probably fine. <laughs> Legitimately, that is a. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. 
and the whole ultra processed side of it too. You know, look at all the it's studies right. about ultra processed food yep. and don't eat it, don't eat it in the human side. And yet veterinarians, that's all they prescribe or, you know, tell their, their clients to use. So that's the huge disparity in my mind. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's countless instances where, and it's just revealing of the way that the funding model on the companion animal side right. looks so different from the human side. Countless instances where the human side is advancing its knowledge by building on prior stuff, leading to stuff that if you carried it over to the uh, companion animal side would be very bad for the most powerful corporate actors in that environment. Right. And as a result, well, I would speculate that the reason that it doesn't carry over is for the reason that it would be bad for them. And, and they have such an influential role to play in mm -hmm. determining whether it's carried over. Yeah. We have a, a question that came in from our Instagram stories from getting cheese fries. Are we sure <laughs> they manufactured those results? I feel sure, but I already have no faith in kibble. And I think what they're asking is, we we put up a post saying that uh, you know Hills allegedly manipulated the research and started spreading information. Can you talk a little bit about what evidence you gathered to to file this? I guess to to generally say that they had a part in spreading that misinformation. Yeah. So maybe this is where they're going. Well, so yes. Yeah, so let me talk about that a little bit, and I'll hit on one specific thing that maybe they're getting at, which is all right. So I. The big thing that I have done that like uh, just hasn't been done by too many others or anybody else is using the Freedom of Information Act to get a bunch mm -hmm. of records from the FDA. So like you, Ruby, before I started doing doggy stuff, I was a lawyer. I had heard about the Freedom of Information Act through and I'm an avid reader. You read you learn about it through understanding the journalistic process and through understanding this, the, the kind of like scientific process or the legal legal world. And so what the Freedom of Information Act is, is in essence, it's a federal law that says any citizen gets to ask the government, show me all your records on something. And unless it, the something falls into an exception that's defined in the statute, the government kind of has to say yes. Mm -hmm. And the exceptions are broad, though. They include things like, I can't ask for your social security number. You know what I mean? I can't. Uh, similarly, I can't be like, oh, tell me the latest from the front lines of the negotiations with Israel and Palestine over like the military operations and what have you. <laughs> like, there are matters of national security that are classified, that are not uh, subject to the Freedom of Information Act. But unless something falls into one of those buckets, they kind of have to give it to you. You got to pay for the copies or whatever, but like they got to give it to you. And so when I thought things smelled bad in the DCM investigation, I was like, I'm going to file a FOIA request and just be like, give me the whole file because I want to understand how this investigation came about and some of the things that I would want to know if I was reading, if I wanted to understand the significance of this investigation. And the FDA originally said, no, we don't have to do that. It falls <laughs> into this exception. They said it falls into the exception that it's an ongoing investigation. And what that means in, in this context, I mean, it obviously was an ongoing investigation mm -hmm. been 2019. It, but they're referring to an exception that's not actually just that. It's like a criminal ongoing yeah. criminal investigation, I can't be like, oh, the government is trying to look at whether I conducted some map massive kidnapping ring. Oh, government, give me your whole file on me. They can say, <laughs> no, that's an ongoing investigation. We don't have to do that. This is not an investigation like that, where you can like give away, where you can tip the hand. The FDA in this case is trying to understand a scientific issue, right? right. They're investigating something, trying to understand it in that term. And so I was like, no, this doesn't apply. They didn't roll over for it. I sued them. I won. They started giving me the thing. So you need to have like the familiarity with FOIA, the, you know, kind of like gumption to keep going and fight it in the court. And then they started doing it. And then it took three years to give me all of it. Like they would send me, it's the federal government we're talking about here. So <laughs> 600 highly redacted pages every few weeks for three years. And I had to sift through, there's ultimately about 20,000 pages of documents. I got to sift through all that and put together the story. And what the story that you get from that and from some stuff that's outside of that, too, is that the FDA investigation wasn't produced by a spike in DCM cases that came into the FDA all at once from pet owners around the country. Mm -hmm. That was sort of the way that the investigation was framed for the public at the time was like the FDA said, in essence, look, we got a spike in cases involving this disease and these products. We're going to look at it. Like if you and if that's really the case, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Like if somebody in Alaska, 
if you're used to seeing very few of these cases, and then all of a sudden a bunch of unrelated people all see them at the same time, that's a worrisome thing. That's a sign. You should be looking mm -hmm. at that. That's not what happened here. What happened here, when you get the records behind the scene that the FDA hasn't made public, is that 75%, 21 out of 28, there are only 28 cases, by the way, that got reported to the FDA before they announced it. 28 out of a nation of wow. million dollars. 21 out of the 28 came from two people, and they are two of the defendants in the case, Lisa Freeman and another mm. defendant. <laughs> Those 21 cases came from just them, okay? The other, that's like, oh, that's, Okay, that changes the public perception about it. That's not what the FDA has told us, and it's kind of seems fishy, but it's not like ironclad evidence that they did anything wrong. They would they could say, for instance, well, we're vets, we are really sensitive to this issue, we've been reporting it. But there's a second fact that they show too, and that's the really like they cherry picked the cases, and there's sure. evidence that shows it. They didn't just go. Well, every time a dog got DCM, we told the FDA about it. And we're going to because we want the FDA to see if there are patterns and what kinds right. of things are getting it. That's not what they did. Wow. What they did is they actively looked for BEG cases and sent those to the FDA and mm. didn't send them the cases that they were getting involving B DCM and dogs not fed those kind of diets. So the FDA from the FDA side, it's like, oh, my gosh, these board certified cardiologists Mm -hmm. Sending me uh, a bunch. I've, I've seen all these cases that all involves the same phenomenon. You can sort of, you can see how it would raise enough to follow up on. Mm -hmm. I, the, the FDA, at least, at very least, dropped the ball in representing the public in this case. Like they should have done more diligence into who sure. these people were that were reporting yeah. it. But you can at least see, like, oh, that's that would catch your if you're you put yourselves in their shoes, like right. that would catch your attention. But uh, yeah. That, that's the reality of what the documents show. And that's a big part of the allegations in, in the suit is that that's sure. right. Well, I mean, we've got over what, 60, 70 million dogs in America. 28 cases is nothing. <laughs> well, and it's also, the, it's like, think of this. This is like, gets a little mathy, but before grain-free diets were popular, before there was like blue buffalo pet food, and certainly long before the FDA's investigation. Lisa Freeman herself, this woman who to a large degree is responsible for this being a controversy, wrote a textbook subject about cardiology issues in dogs. And this is discussed mm -hmm. in the book. She herself says, dilated cardiomyopathy is the second most popular cardiac disease among dogs in the United States. And this was 2007, I think, maybe hmm. I'll get that wrong, but something like 2007, like a long time ago. Okay. Second most popular cardiac disease among dogs in the United States and dogs in the United States, 10% of them will get cardiac diseases. So you're talking about if there is no link whatsoever between right. this disease and these diets, you're talking about hundreds of thousands, at least maybe millions of animals a year that are getting DCM. And so right. the idea that you could from a sample of 21, like even if you did feel confident they weren't cherry picked, that you could be like this rate is higher. It's just like, sure. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. and I you, you need to show so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Kay and I probably share the theory that uh, DCM is caused by a lack of taurine and a few other things is what, why do you think these cases came about? What's your personal belief? Well, I, I can tell you this, this, the scientific community knew very well, long before the FDA began investigating BEG diets and any potential link to DCM, that you can definitely give a dog DCM by what mm -hmm. you Absolutely. You won't find any disagreement for me either. Right, right. And as you as you highlighted, it goes through the use of taurine, and this is like the scientific community has known for a long time. Right. There are some there are some amino acids that a dog doesn't make on its own, and that you have to feed it for it to make taurine in its own body in sufficient quantities not to get DC. Right. Okay, and you guys have told your listeners this a million times. They're called cysteine right. and methionine. methionine. Right, and the reason the the like. You can see that reality embodied in the regulation that govern the sale of pet food in the United States. If you want to sell, I know from being a manufacturer, you want to sell commercial pet food as being complete and balanced, you have to meet AFCO's various nutritional profiles that are based to one degree or another on the existing scientific record. They say, in essence, it's got to have this much of this thing or else a dog, we think a dog is going to get a deficiency disease. The reason there are cysteine and methionine requirements for dogs for complete and balanced diets mm -hmm. is for this reason. If you don't right. do that, the scientific community knows you can get DCM. So right. while it's what, on the other hand, the, the, the group BEG diets 
is so varied and non-cohesive. Like it includes everything from raw diets to kibble ones, homemade to billion dollar brand, you know, all meat to zero meat vegan diets. Like they're all part of that group. And there's just no consistent nutritional through line that they all have. And so like the idea that you could come up with something that links them all together that's causing DCM is like is a patently absurd thing at first at baseline. But it's definitely possible, just like it's possible that a non-BEG pet food could intentionally or inadvertently not have enough cysteine and methionine and the dog gets DCM. And it's like I, I do think that in the history of the U.S. pet food industry, that has happened from time mm-hmm. to time. Someone has put out a recipe where they've been like, we think this is good. It's got enough cysteine and methionine. The dog's going to absorb enough cysteine and methionine. Mm-hmm. And in reality, they got it wrong. And dogs right. got DCM. But it's like whether it is a fair, accurate thing to extend that more broadly to millions of other products that have nothing to do with that one is absurd. Sure. I mean, creating that BEG classification to her demise like i mean she she did it to have this really broad um category of companies yeah that's how it seems i think i think when the dust settles on this that will be something that lisa freeman regrets attempting because i think it's a it was a mistake to try to convince the public that they're like it's just someone who knows as much about the scientific record as it pertains to matters of companion animal nature. Somebody knows as much about that as Lisa Freeman. Like there are no, you could count on your hands. How many people know more about that subject, those mm-hmm. subjects? Like it's just, and the idea that someone with that much experience, she's been doing it for decades, knows yeah. that much, but would somehow be like, well, I just thought they might all have something in common that was doing this. <laughs> so ridiculous and it's really what's yeah it caused a lot more pushback and yeah Yeah. but at least you had a question that's actually not about that it's like had she not done that and had instead she said well it's really just about grains and that Mm -hmm. we're going to pursue the theory that if your dog doesn't eat enough grains there it maybe it would have looked somewhat the the issue would have played out somewhat differently so the Mm -hmm. person question asks you hear all day long, you need to add grains to support the heart. Whereas the science that says grains are beneficial to the heart. It's in essence, it's people misinterpreting or being misled about the scientific record around this subject. It's like people play fast and loose with the language, either intentionally or inadvertently. And that's one of the ways that it's been generalized is some people will say, you know, we've learned that if you don't have grains, then they might get TCM. So you put some grains in there and that's yep. the generalized that's answer. Really- yeah, we well, hear that we hear that a lot when we're talking about our raw diet that we recommend. Well, there's no grains in there. The dogs are going to get DCM. But you know and, what? No, go just finish your thought. I'll tell you. I'll, no, I was just saying. Even at veterinary conferences, they I'll uh, talk to veterinarians, and they'll be like, "No, but you have to have grains in there, or they're going to get DCM." They're still thinking this. Well, well, y- yes, and it shows that they haven't been exposed to the right information. But it right. also, I'll bet you, you hear that from smarter people. Those are because those people are like, they hear a B, wait, the risk is BEG diets. And they, on some intuitive level, are like, but those, that has nothing in common. Like, at least that is a cohesive, like, mm-hmm. plausible enough, although wrong theory. You know, maybe there is something special in grains that does something that impacts, it's like, it's flawed for all kinds of reasons, but right. at least it's not like patently. Doesn't make it. Sense. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. like you can see where people come to that from. It just neglects, like, you know, a little bit of I don't know, hundreds of millions of years of significance of evolutionary development. <laughs> Maybe one thing you might say, but. Sure. <laughs> well, Danny, would we'd love to have you back on in a couple of months to sort of give us an update on what's what's going on. But I also would love to dive a little deeper into the science and nutrition. I think um, we do share a common belief that there's far too many carbs and starches in foods. And um, although how you and I produce our foods might be vastly different. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we're almost out of time. So I want to end on this note. Jolene asks, how can we help with your efforts? And this is coming from, I I guess, you know, any dog owner that wants their dogs to live longer and not run into these issues later down the line. Oh, well, I mean, I think that if I'm just 
if you want to know how to help, like make your dog's life better, like, I think I would say to that person, like, start from the place of DCM is what, whether or not I'm going to choose a BEG diet for my dog, what kind of complete and balanced commercially sold product I'm going to feed my dog is going to be driven by DCM related concerns. I would counsel that person to take that issue and move it to the back of the line. Start thinking about things that are more, because there are a lot of things that are more significant in terms of disease and um, more well supported by the evidence. You know, if you want to talk about how to help with advancing the litigation, I'd encourage you to tell other people about it, particularly folks who do this stuff professionally. I, like I said, lots of those folks, the folks who are clinicians, are, will come into this being like, who is this self-appointed internet expert? And they have every, they, they ought to, that is how it ought to be. But if you can get them to engage with the material, I bet on the fact that at least some chunk of them is going to come away with their perspective changed to some degree, read the lawsuit, that kind of thing. So advocating mm -hmm. for it at that level, I think is important. And then if you, one other thing is if you're a retailer who's been damaged by this, reach out to the lawyers that you can find, reach out to me, I can put you in touch with them or the lawyers mm -hmm. themselves. That's something you can do that's helpful. And then just stay on top of the issue. If you come to our website, we have like a whole part of it that's devoted to the litigation and getting you updated. And so you can sign up at those updates. That's a good thing. Um, that yeah, about, it's just, it. the healthy pet said as an independent retailer, we definitely lost sales in 2019 because of this misinformation. Daniel says he responds to every email. So if you want to reach out to him, you want to be in touch with lawyers that are trying to put together a case to earn money for people that have been put in that situation. Uh, find me. I'm, I'll put you in touch with them. They are good. Yeah. And you don't need to pay. Like, just to be clear, like part of the reason that this is an affordable thing is like the folks that bring class action cases like this, the lawyers that do this professionally, they have like their financial model is like they bear the risk of like a lot of times you see little guys, not too big guys, because the big guys have the money to just litigate you into the ground. And that right. would undoubtedly be the case here. Right. But in a class action context, the way that that's they represent lots of folks like that. And mm -hmm. so it's like they need to operate somewhat differently. And so they borrow in light of theories that they think are good and they have enough money to fight it all the way to the end when they get paid out, should you be successful? And so like, right. it's not an issue. There's no, like, I'm not coming out at this point being like, I need more money to keep paying my legal bills. That's not a thing, but. Uh... Yeah, no, for sure. And, and the fact that these attorneys have taken it on means that they see mm -hmm. that there's, mm -hmm. there's something wrong here. Yeah. There are people that are, Motivated by principle. These are some of the best class action. Like, just to be clear, uh, you might know, like, these are not, these are people that are involved in the Apple DOJ antitrust. Okay. Like literally was talking to them earlier today about the significance of that. It's like, these are really, really legit people that don't get granted tens of millions of dollars unless they believe a lot in a theory's ability to recover. At the end of right. The right. It, right. It is a mm -hmm. big endorsement. And if you read the complaint, it's 125 pages long. It's like, it's serious. I, you can't say at this stage whether a court's going to think that liability fall, you know, that we win the case as mm -hmm. it were. But you can't look at this. And it's part of why I like, like being like, tell vets about this. It's like, you can't look at this and be like, oh, this is just obviously bullshit. Like, no, no, sure. it's very obviously not bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, whether they ultimately win or not will be determined. But like, right. So. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Daniel, for joining us. We uh, hope to have you back on in a few months to give us yeah. an update. Yeah, I look Sounds forward great. to it. I'm happy to come back whenever you guys want. Like what you said, sounds good. I'd like to talk about other subjects this one yeah. all day long. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great Thanks weekend.